So uh, welcome to the Monday night uh, speaker series uh, hosted by Northwest Aquatic Marine Educators. My name is Woody Moses. Uh, I am co-director of the Washington chapter of NAME. Uh, my wife is the other co-director and she's, she's out walking the dog right now and she'll be back shortly. Uh, that's Joe Vanina Sowers. Uh, we do these talks every Monday evening, uh, sorry, every the first Monday of the month, um, October through June. Uh, so we've got a couple more coming up. The next talk, May 2nd, will be from Peter Moe, who's an English professor at Seattle Pacific University, who wrote a book called Touching This Leviathan about uh, rearticulating the skeleton of a uh, gray whale um, and his, his work with that. So looking forward to, uh, to that presentation. We take the summers off because uh, we like to go out and do fun stuff and everybody else does too. And then we come back in the fall again and, and do this again. Just sort of a reminder for folks, just sort of basic Zoom etiquette um, to, to be muted uh, during the, the presentation. And if you do have questions, you can just throw them in the chat and I'll be keeping track of those. Um, Ann and I talked earlier today. Sounds like there's gonna be some really great discussion later on. So definitely if you have ideas, um, we'd love to hear them. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Well, I should give a big plug for the name conference this summer uh, in August, August 5th through the 10th, 6th through the 10th, I guess. 5th will be the, anyway, 6th to the 10th um, down in Neatarts, Oregon. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, check out the name website for that. Great. And now, Wonderful. Um, for tonight's speaker, Ann Erickson. Uh, Ann will be introduced, not by me, uh, but by um, someone else. Uh, Peggy, Peggy, are you going to Peggy, do that? are you unmuted? <laughs> sure, I'm ready to do that with pleasure. Um, I've known Ann ever since I moved to Victoria, and um, she was my neighbor. And then I started finding out more and more about her, and I I realized that she's a biologist, um, really the heart of a biologist and a writer. And the writing piece was wonderful because at the time I was working on a book and she was helping me out a great deal. She published quite a few novels. Um, she calls them novels. And I think Kathy and I both think that they're sort of natural history natural historical novels, because there's so much information in them that's so interesting. Um, she's also lately been publishing children's uh, nonfiction books, or I shouldn't say children, for younger readers. Um, that first was Dive In, exploring our connection with the ocean, really appropriate for this group. And then Bird's Eye View, keeping wild birds in flight. And now tonight, I think she's going to talk to us about the urgent mes message from a hot planet navigating the climate crisis, a very beautiful book. Um, Anne is also known to me because of her connection to Thetis Island, where I spend a little bit of time, not nearly enough. Uh, she's one of the founding directors of the Thetis Island Nature Conservancy, and it's made a huge difference to the island. There's a lot more uh, publicly available land on the island and a lot more awareness of what a delicate and beautiful environment that island houses. She also works with Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. Many of you know uh, Nikki and Sea Change, and uh, she's working with them restoring nearshore marine ecosystems. And that is part of the um, the way that we can address climate change by by working with nature and lives um, with her partner on Thetis Island. And so it's still one of my neighbors, which is really, really nice. So I don't want to talk anymore. I really want to hear from you, Anne, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. And uh, it's always been, it's always a pleasure whenever Peggy comes to Thetis, she phones us from the ferry and says, I'm coming by to say hi. So we always have a, a nice visit. And I, it's always a pleasure also to go to her land uh, here on Thetis, which is uh, especially this time of year covered with wildflowers, just a fabulous place. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how that goes. Oh, Woody, you have to able me again.
Now again. Okay. Slide show, there we go. Okay, everybody see, you can see that? Great. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk to you about this book. Um, I, it, it was not the easiest book in the world to write, I have to admit that. And you're going to hear quite a bit about my beleaguered husband, Gary, throughout because I have brought him kicking and screaming into the climate conversation. When I first started researching the book, I, would, I was reading all of these grim messages and, and he would, uh, and, and then relating them to him because I needed somebody to talk to about it. Um, and he would go, no, no, don't tell me anymore. And, but then slowly he came around and we really have great conversations about it. So why did I write this book? Uh, as Gary says, uh, what else would you be writing about right now? I had finished my two uh, other ecological literacy books, as Peggy mentioned, and uh, was looking around for another project and Orca Press uh, sort of was looking for, for writers to write about climate for young readers. And uh, so I, I jumped into it um, with both feet, I have to say. And uh, it just came out in, in mid-January and uh, it's been getting actually really good reviews. I've been very pleased. And I, I was telling Kathy and, and Yogi and Woody that I just got a request from a young reader who's reading it and he wants an interview. So that's very, very special. Uh, the other thing that was really wonderful is that uh, Elizabeth May uh, wrote a blurb for the book and she called it a toolbox for hope, which is really what I was aiming for. The book's dedicated to nature. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work and play on the traditional unceded territory of the Homokamedam speaking Coast Salish people, particularly the Penelicut tribe, and I look straight over to Penelicut Island from my, my uh, working studio. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the, the cedars and the Douglas fir and the, the eagles and the whales and the sea lions and the seals and the salmon and the eelgrass and the kelp, the fungus, even the viruses and the bacteria that all uh, that we share this beautiful world with and that um, also deserve to uh, exist in, in, and flourish. Uh, the, the, um, the words of, of the late Barry Commoner uh, who wrote The Laws of Ecology, that everything is connected to everything else has really been one of my kind of rallying calls and my mantra throughout the books that I've written for young readers. Just to give you a sense of what's in the book, this is the table of contents. The picture on the left is from a uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, ra uh, uh, protest in the UK. The book is quite broad. Uh, it covers uh, sort of a lot of, a, a lot of ground. Uh, it's about 240 pages long. And so I wasn't able to include a lot of detail in, in all of these sections, but um, it gives a pretty broad overview. So first chapter is a climate science primer. The second one, the consequences of global heating. And those are the kind of two sort of diff more difficult chapters in the book. Um, and they're broken up with um, a lot of sidebars and uh, some kind of uplifting uh, information about what kinds of actions people are taking. Chapter three is how we got here. And I call it the isms and Asians chapter. Uh, looks at um, how we got into this the situation that we're in. Uh, colonialism, um, extractivism, racism, uh, all of all of capitalism and consumerism, all of those, all of those things that those human constructs that have put us in this situation. Chapter four is uh, really positive, all about change makers and climate heroes, uh, people from all walks of life who've been um, working on the uh, on the um, on the climate file in all kinds of ways, youth, indigenous people, scientists, politicians, artists, regular people, 
are, are all in there. And I wrote it partly as a tribute to all of those people, but also to let young people know that they weren't alone and that there were uh, many millions of people working on this. And chapter five is the solutions to the climate crisis. And I'm gonna focus on that a little more later on. So I won't say too much about that, but it's, it looks at what, what we need to do now. And then the last chapter, and sometimes I think it's the most important chapter is what if just in case, how do we live in a changing and uncertain world? There are a few um, kind of special touches in the book that I, that I really like. Um, uh, and I think that makes it kind of unique. Uh, there, these are youth voices. There's about 13 of them uh, spread out throughout the book. And early on, I put out a call on social media to young people to send in stories and poems and artwork, photographs, and we and uh, brought people from all all around the world. So the the tribute to the dead coral on the left here is is from a young uh, woman, Claire Doty Housden, who was 12 at the time now 13, and um, uh, she lives on Galliano Island. And then uh, on the right here is, this is Neombi Morris, a young Ugandan um, man who has been uh, striking for joining in the school strikes for climate, but he's recently started planting thousands of trees and talking to schools and school children about what he's doing and why he's doing it. Uh, we have Submissions from Turkey and Australia and India, Canada, US and the UK. This is what, there's about a half a dozen of these that I call burning questions. And these are the kind of questions that young people are asking themselves now. And I really think like what kind of world have we created where children and young people have to ask these kind of questions. Should I have children? What do we do about the climate migrants? Will humans go extinct? Those kinds of questions. Um, and I, I think it's, it, it really uh, hopefully sparks a lot of conversation. Okay, anybody here suffering from climate anxiety? <laughs> I see a nod from, from Woody there. Um, I put quite a bit of emphasis on climate anxiety uh, throughout the book. Um, a, a poll that was taken in 2019 showed that most American uh, young people are afraid of climate change and are feeling anxious about it. Um, I certainly do, and most of the people I know uh, have been talking about it to me as well. The woman in the floppy hat is Kate Shapira. She's a poet and SAS to teacher and an activist from, uh, oh, where is she from? Not bad. Anyway, she's from the US. And uh, she put a little table up around her town, Providence, Rhode Island, that's where she's from, around her town in the summertime. And her, that little sign says, climate anxiety counseling, five cents. And she just has people randomly walk up to her and they talk about the climate crisis. And I'm just gonna read the second paragraph here um, that she wrote to me. People tell me their fears about undrinkable water, losing plants and animals, having to leave their homes and the possibility that humans may not survive these changes at all. I listen, ask questions, and help them connect with ongoing efforts to tend the soil and water, pressure lawmakers about climate policy, or fight fossil fuel companies and other polluters. And one thing I forgot to mention is I, I'm actually going to talk you know, as short as possible because I really want to have the conversation with all of you about these kinds of things. And I'll be posing a few questions at the end of the talk, but um, feel free to ask anything when we get there. So why, uh, you know, we have actually really good reason to be anxious. This is the latest on the climate crisis. And this list was given to me by a climate scientist. It's real, it's now, it's bad, the experts agree, caused by us. So we're, we're where we are, we're about 1.2 degrees Celsius above, uh, above the temperature that it was before the uh, Industrial Revolution, so 1850 to 1900. We've got about 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that doesn't include some of the other greenhouse gases like methane and um, 
uh, the nitrous oxide. And you hear a lot about kind of, you know, we've got these goals of 1.5 degrees C and 2 degrees C and, and uh, you know, those, those are put out as kind of aspirational goals. But even now at 1.2 and 420, the world is experiencing a lot of climate disaster. And I, I know we've all felt it this year with the heat dome and, and the uh, atmospheric rivers, the sea levels are rising, um, got uh, biodiversity extinctions, uh, storms, droughts, um, climate migrants, and a lot of, a lot of pending kind of health, um, human, human health uh, uh, consequences as well. So how do we get, how do we get back to where we need to be, which is pre-industrial, more, no more than one degree C above pre-industrial temperatures. And the scientists saying we need to be below 350 it means that we need to stop putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but we also need to take some out. Now here's the good news. We were hoping there'd be some. We know what to do and how to do it. So what are those things that we need to know, that we need, that we do know? We need to stop burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels provide about 80% of our energy. It seems like a really, really big deal for us to, to do that. And we're being told that we need to do that by 2050. And I would say as soon as possible. Um, when, when I started writing, Garrett, my beleaguered Gary uh, says, whenever I write a book, we have to change our lifestyle. And true to form, uh, I, I uh, convinced him to buy, that we need to buy an electric car which we did about four years ago. And I call it NK after Naomi Klein, the famous uh, climate activist and writer. And we've never regretted that decision. Uh, governments need to do uh, a lot in terms of uh, removing subsidies from fossil fuel development and um, production. Um, the 350.org started a divestment campaign, which has really done a lot. Uh, and encouraging um, businesses and individuals to divest from fossil fuels in their investment portfolios. And I, for one, have cut up my RBC credit card and switched over to a credit union uh, because uh, of the ba banking on fossil fuels report that came out, put RBC in the top five investors in fossil fuels. Transition to clean new renewable energy. So I dragged the beleaguered Gary in, in, along into putting solar panels on our roof in order to charge our electric car. Uh, clean renewable energy is possible, no matter what you might hear from some of the detractors. Um, Dr. Mark Jacobson from Stanford University in 2009 put out a paper that showed how the world could transition to clean renewable energy 100% using wind, water, and solar. So we, we can do it, but it depends on also our actions to be energy efficient, but also to consume less. Uh, our consumption, especially in, in the West, in, the, in North America and Europe, uh, is certainly drives a lot of the warming. Um, but also um, the concept of degrowth, I spend quite a bit of time talking about that in the book, our, our talk about the, the need for perpetual growth, economic growth is a huge driver. And degrowth is the concept of living more simply, uh, closer together as communities, doing things like producing our own energy in uh, decentralized grids, all that kind of thing. Um, Guy Dauncey, the environmentalist from Vancouver Island calls it the economics of kindness. I just love that term. We can learn a lot from Indigenous peoples um, and Indigenous people make up only 5% of the population of the world, but they steward about 80% of the biodiversity. And they also have, have lived for thousands of years in the same place and they've learned how to live in harmony with nature. 
So we can learn all of those things from them. And, and I'm really grateful for the connections that I've been able to make with the people on Penelicate. It's been a, a slow journey, but it's, it's, uh, it's moving along. And we've been working actually on a nature stewards uh, program with Edith Island together. So I'm really grateful for that. And do no harm or as little as possible. So I call it kind of looking at all of our choices with an equity and an ecological lens. So if a solution to climate change or a proposed solution to climate change destroys a wetland or pollutes uh, a disadvantaged community, it's not a real solution. And it's, you know, it's about, it's, a, it's certainly a balancing act because everything we do has an impact, has a consequence of some sort. And it's really up to us to, to make that a positive or a negative impact. And sometimes, you know, it's, it, it's not a race, you know, don't beat up on yourself. Um, but if we can really start thinking around uh, doing that, doing no harm and thinking through those two lenses, we'll, we'll be able to move things forward. And, which I think is the most important is stop destroying nature and let it recover. Did you know that, know that there was a blue new deal proposed in the US to restore and protect ocean ecosystems. I didn't know that until I started researching this book. Uh, this, the destruction of nature is thought by many scientists to contribute as much to global warming as greenhouse gases. So it's imperative that we restore nature and also protect it. So I'm going to use a case study, <laughs> a sea change story, I call it. And I know Nikki is on the call and I hope she's not embarrassed by all the nice things I'm going to say about her. I work for sea change. I've been working for sea change for the last five years on this project, the Salish Sea Near Shore Habitat Recovery Project. And it's a really great example of how nonprofits and small organizations working with communities can make a difference. So this sign here, is a sign that we just developed for the website to satisfy the Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, requirements for signage. But it gives a, a sense of what has been accomplished over the last five years. Uh, we've planted over 30,000 eelgrass shoots in 24 sites. Over 59 metric tons of debris have been removed. And it's now up to four riparian sites will have been restored by the end of the project. We have. Uh, an extra year because of COVID, we've been given an extension. And hats off to the, the Government of Canada for funding the Coastal Restoration Fund projects, which also include things like salt marsh restoration um, and, uh, and, and other kind of coastal, coastal restoration. So how does sea change do this? Uh, education is certainly huge. Uh, you can see on the left, there's Nikki. She's uh, up at North Cove on Thetis Island. This was, I think, the second time that I had met her. I didn't really know her very well. And she came to Thetis for one of our programs, our, con our conservancy programs, and talked to actually quite a, a large group of, of islanders that came out for this talk and taught us how this simple little flowering plant that a lot of people thought was a nuisance because it got caught in the props of their boats was so important to the environment um, for all kinds of reasons. And Nikki also always brings in community. Community is huge in the um, Salish Sea Near Shore Habitat Recovery Project. It was all really based on community. We started with community meetings, taking uh, recommendations from, from community men members on the places where they lived, where they thought restoration would be important. And community members also come out to all the restorations. Uh, we've been putting up these signs help protect eelgrass all over the Salish, Canadian Salish Sea area. And we have about, I think, close to 50 signs up now. Restoration is really something that Sea Change does really, really well. And again, involves community. This is a group of students from the Saturna Ecological Education Center, which is a very special school, um, brings high school students. It's a Gulf Island uh, district program but it brings students from all over the Gulf Islands and Vancouver Island and the mainland. And they, 
they uh, live on, on uh, Saturna three days a week and um, was really experientially uh, um, focused. And they came with their, their teacher, Martin Aven Avenich, and they've been at three different um, Saturna restorations with us. And it really gives you an opportunity to connect with young people, but also to talk to them about ways that they can contribute. So, so we've, you know, been planting all this eelgrass, those 30,000 sheep have certainly done a lot to restore habitat for a lot of, of uh, marine life, uh, to help protect shorelines and certainly sequester carbon. Um, a lot of these near shore areas are, are thought to sequester probably, if, if probably more per area than forests uh, sequester carbon. So they're really, really important restoration areas. Um, but as we do this work, we realize that the damage is still continuing. There's still shoreline development and more and more boats all the time anchoring in your grass. And, and so the work we're doing is sometimes like one step forward and one step backwards. So protection is probably the key. Um, as of 2021, 17% of the world's land and 8% of the ocean is in some kind of protected status. Over on the right here, that is the beleaguered Gary there on the left. And uh, uh, one of our board, former board members, um, Rodney Brownlee, and they're standing by a sign. I, I managed to get Gary to come along and put in posts and help me put in signs. And this is a uh, called the Fairy Slipper Forest Nature Reserve, which is um, a 40 acre reserve on Thetis Island that the islanders raised uh, over $500,000 to purchase this land. And it's now, we put a trail in it. It's, it's owned by the Islands Trust Conservancy, which is the conservation arm of the Islands Trust. And it's become a really beloved place on, on Thetis. So it, it gets somewhere into that 17% of the world's land, but where do we need to be? So Canada has signed on to um, international initiative to protect 30% of the world by 3030, that's land and ocean. Um, the famous uh, ecologist E.O. Wilson uh, started an initiative called Nature Needs Half. We really believe that half of nature needs to be properly protected with, with proper restrictions to make sure biodiversity is, is actually protected. So a lot of that 17 and 8% are in protected areas, but they're not necessarily um, going, going to actually do the job. So, so I want to just say a little bit about, about what I called in my Facebook post kind of subversive protection, or what, what would be voluntary measures. Um, the gover you know, government getting to 30% is, I have to say I'm kind of skeptical and 30% in a good way. Um, the uh, Southern Strait of Georgia Marine National Marine Conservation Area has been in the works for 25 years and we still have not seen, uh, yeah, we still haven't seen it. So how do we do that? So Sea Change is doing, is doing some voluntary protections and you'll, and you know, we borrowed these from Washington State and you'll probably recognize some of them. I took this picture or this picture was taken at Port Townsend on the left here, putting in voluntary no anchor zones. Uh, so when I was at the NAME conference in 2019, um, I went down to the waterfront and was very struck by how those boys that say eelgrass protection voluntary uh, worked. There were no, absolutely no boats inside that protect, voluntary protection area. So sea changes started to um, put them in. We have uh, one on Bowen Island and uh, Nikki can chime in if we've got them somewhere else, but we're looking at possibly putting one in at one of the other Gulf Islands and um, really encouraging local communities to do this as a way to subversively protect eelgrass. Um, and then the other initiative we've been taking is these seafloor friendly moorings that uh, have a suspended buoy that keeps the, the, um, the, the road or the chain, if you, if you use chain, off of the eelgrass bed, so it causes a lot of damage as the boat swings um, and scours the seabed. Uh, so we have uh, put in uh, some on 
um, up on Hornby Island and some are also on, in Bowen Island. So I'd like to get to questions soon. So I'm just gonna finish up with a few more slides. Uh, I love this cartoon, Grandma survived the Great Depression because her supply chain was local and she knew how to do stuff. Um, here's some kind of tips that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're teaching um, young people or old people, here are some tips of things to do that are gonna make a difference. Lobby decision makers and hold them to their promises. Vote for climate wise candidates. And if you have a young person who can't vote, really support the uh, initiative to lower the voting age to 16. Uh, it's happening in some places around the world, but uh, not yet here in BC or in Canada. I don't know, I don't think in the US either. Limit your personal use of fossil fuels. Aim for two tons per person per year. Uh, North America is about 16 tons that we, uh, of emissions that we um, that we emit per person, uh, quite a bit over two tons. Uh, other places in the world are, are lower. Um, Europe tends to be about four or five tons. And I am, um, there's lots of great uh, kind of carbon calculators around. Uh, and I, I just recently used one called Car um, Climate Heroes and it was very easy to use. And I, I, I have stopped flying except to go see my mom. Uh, my mom lives in Edmonton and uh, I fly there in the winter when I, when I, when I don't feel comfortable driving. And, uh, and the rest of the time I drive the electric car over the mountains, it's quite a, I stop about 16 times to charge. It's kind of funny. Um, so that's, that's then when I put that one flight in, that one short round trip flight, it bumped me way over uh, five to five tons. Really encourage people to make choices through an ecology and an equity lens. You know, do I really need that new cell phone? Um, how about that new pair of jeans? Uh, looking at sort of the supply chain, where did it come from? How was it made? Uh, was anybody exploited in order to have it made? All of those things uh, are going to really make a difference if we can all do that. And practice self-care if we're all demoralized and exhausted. We're not going to be any good to anybody. So this is one of the questions that I asked the many dozens of people that I interviewed for the book. Uh, scientists, young people, uh, environmentalists, uh, people involved in community, um, in community organizing. And I said, how do you look after yourself in light of the difficult news that's coming out all the time? And the answers ranged from, you know, meditation, getting exercise, eating well, spending time with your friends, turning off your cell phone, dancing, swimming. There were all kinds of things. And one of the common factors was, uh, was spending time in nature. And I go back to learn to do stuff. That's the, the grandma survived the Great Depression. The last chapter uh, lists quite a lot of, of uh, things that we might need to know if uh, our efforts at turning the climate crisis around are actually going to work. So this this is just a this is a picture of Clam Bay, which is just around the corner from my house. And I read a book uh, called The End of Ice by a man named Damar Dal Jamar Dal Jamar Jamal. Sorry, messing that up. But he in, in one chapter he talked about if we could all find a place in nature that we really love and fight like hell to protect it, imagine what that would do due to the planet. So the people out here on this mud flat are Penelicate clamors. And these Penelicate clamors, their ancestors have been doing the same thing and feeding themselves and looking after this ecosystem for thousands and thousands of years. And I look out and they might be wearing Gore-Tex and they might have headlamps. They, they often in the middle of the night, we see them in front of our house in Canoe Pass. and. Uh, but they're still looking after this ecosystem and still benefiting from it as well. So two closing slides. One of the big takeaways from the book is that taking action with others is an antidote to, antidote to despair. And I really feel it, especially when I'm 
you know, working with community members while doing transplants for um, sea change or building a trail with the uh, Thieves Island Nature Conservancy. Um, it's just uplifting and it makes you just feel really positive. And just a final message, it's never too late to act. This is uh, a climate scientist, Naveen Ramanpati, who teaches uh, first year climate science at UBC. And he has participated as many scientists are doing in, um, in the climate actions. And he made this sign, it's never too late to act. 1.5 degrees is better than two, two is better than three, three is better than four. And I asked him to review, review, review the science um, chapter in my book to make sure it was accurate. And he said, it would be my pleasure. We scientists have done all we can do. We need others like you to create a social movement and make the change that needs to happen. I just want to let you know about ORCA's future activist contest, uh, which ends on the 14th of, of April. And we're asking uh, young people in middle and high school to create um, uh, climate signs, uh, protest signs, and or write a letter to an elected official. And uh, the winners will be drawn um, at random and they'll win a, um, six books from Orca Press and also a $100 gift certificate to a environmental charity of their choice. So give a plug for Sea Change. And the URL for that contest is at the bottom. Okay, here's my burning questions for you. Do you practice subversive actions to protect and restore nature? How do you teach about the impacts of the climate crisis on the environment? Do you have any creative lesson plans you can pass on? That sort of thing. How do you convey the difficult information that's coming at us all the time? And do you experience climate anxiety or grief in your work and with your audience? And how do you deal with it? How do you look after yourself? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And let's talk. Um, and well, what, what do you have expanded? <laughs> and actually- Hi, Jovanina. Hey. My, be my better half is literally my better half. <laughs> um, uh, and actually, could uh, you want me to bring that up again? Yeah. And um, or I wonder if there's a way to if shift I could it off to the chat. Yeah. If, um, and we don't need to talk about these questions either. I'm no, open to whatever I, you want to bring up. I think it's a great starting point. And I was wondering if you could copy, just copy that and then throw it in the chat. And then we could, then we could be back. We could see our bigger selves. Okay. And then we could look at the chat as well. Um, All right. Let's see if I can manage that. Yeah. But start talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I got to get this book. Like I, I feel, I feel kind of silly that I just already <laughs> have it. I, uh, I've, I've been teaching about climate change for over 20 years. And um, this summarizes, I mean, based on what you presented, it summarizes things so well uh, because it, one of the big problems that I have with teaching about climate change uh, and experiencing as well is it's, it, it's, it's, it's a nonlinear system, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's so complicated and, and diverse and so many of the outcomes are completely unknown, which is part of the problems um, that, uh, the way that you you put it and summarized it and touched on the important scientific points, but also the emotional points as well, which I think is a, a very important gap that needs to be bridged with this subject. Um, I'm I'm excited uh, to read it, uh, which is it, great. The talk was worth it. I've sold one book. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. That's great. And, I, and I've got two I'm bringing down to Oregon for the auction too. Oh, good. Oh, great. <laughs> It's oh, and is it available in the states? Yeah, it's available. It's available on, yeah, it's on uh, Amazon. yeah, it's available. Should be available through bookstores as well. Orca sells quite you know quite a bit into the U.S. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say the spelling is American. Uh, I, I um, had to bite. I had to bite my tongue and do it. But uh, all of Orca's books are in American spelling because they have quite a large audience there. Yeah. 
And it can be bought uh, internationally through the US uh, Orca US as well um, on, online. And in US, it's a lot cheaper than Canadian dollars, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know after the, yeah. But then, it, we it, have, it is. then we have planes flying around to deliver them. That's right. <laughs> I, was, I put the questions in the chat if anybody wants to kind of respond to any of those. I'd love to hear your responses or we can just have a free ranging conversation. Yeah, um, I was just thinking about your, your question of, you know, how do you convey this difficult information? And I was thinking back to when I used to work at the Seattle Aquarium where we were talking about you know, climate change during our, our presentations and our talks, but really always tried to weave in something that people could do or a conversation at the end about what the people were doing already and what differences those made and have examples of success stories as well. Because, you know, being at a public place like an aquarium, we had an opportunity to bring up these mm -hmm. difficult conversations, but you could see the faces on people as you were talking about what was happening and the effects of cars or flying or that sort of thing. And people start to trickle away and then you mm -hmm. sort of have to grab them back in by like, okay, but we can all make a difference and what are you doing and, and try to re-engage and, and, and tell a success story sort of as, as you wrap it up, you know. Mm -hmm. I kind of heard you were talking about that in your book as well of like always having little pieces that we can do. Yeah. Nikki. Thank you, Anne. That was a beautiful presentation. Oh, thank you. Who, I didn't who knew I, that you were an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mention either. I was going to mention at the beginning that our power is actually out here on Thetis. Oh. So this presentation was brought to you compliments of fossil fuels because we've had to start our generator in order to run the modem. So oh that I could gosh. talk to you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So it was a bit stressful today. The power went off early this morning and I woke yeah. up and thought, oh Does no, the one one day when I really need it. And uh, here we are. We still don't have any have it back. So I yeah, wonder, several, several trees you? down. Oh well, well, thank you for turning on the generator and <laughs> and being here for the presentation. Um, we had some crazy winds as well today here in Seattle and hail storms. And so I think we're getting part of that same storm. <laughs> so yeah, it's gone all the way yeah. down to Portland. Yeah. yeah, crazy, crazy day. So Nikki, I don't think you got a chance to say what you're going I, I to say. I just really, really appreciate how you phrased and articulated the problem and, and the issues and the challenges and you did it so gracefully. And I'd be nervous as hell if the power went off in the morning and I had a presentation at night. So kudos. Um, I'm really glad you asked about education, especially and especially around young people to name because that was just such an appropriate question. <clears throat> I think one of the ways it's been really effective um, to reach young people is to do something that's right in front of them. So watershed models are really, really good because they're intriguing. They're three-dimensional uh, physical manifestation of a watershed, which most people have a hard time getting their head around. What is a watershed? When you start talking about systems, and we've been trained not to talk about systems, it, mm -hmm. it's nice to have it all visual and physical. So um, most of my education has been with middle and elementary school children uh, except for a, a quite large proportion of Chinese university students who came over for a University of Victoria program. And those discussions around a watershed table, I wish I had recorded. Anyway, um, not to get off the point, but so we go through on a watershed model, we go through the non-point pollution sources that flow into the ocean. And it's kind of depressing after they're done with their fascination of all the little people and the little trees and little houses and farms. And it's all according to scale to a local watershed. Um, you know, it's fascinating. And then they 
they get it around, oh yeah, whatever we do on the land goes into the fresh water systems, goes into the estuaries and into the open ocean. So we, we, we cover that with, with pouring pollutants on and then making it rain. I think most of you know all this, but then, you know, before the thing is done, we make sure that the conversation turns positive. And I get really excited, uh, genuinely excited when I say, you're faced with this incredible challenge and it's all gonna be really exciting. And it's just as exciting as the people that I knew in my family who watched the transition from horses to automobiles or you know, not having a telephone into your house, having a telephone, like all those pre-computer things that they can hardly imagine. This is as important an era that they're entering into. And then we really start talking about transportation um, because that's the thing that I think that they can they can get their heads around and what kinds of energy will they be using and what kind of noise will they not be hearing if they take their children to school? Like, can they imagine uh, a local busy street like Shelburne in Victoria being absolutely quiet and that you could actually whisper to your children on the street and be heard? Like I just, I just try to manifest the changes that they might see in their own lifetimes to give them a sense of um, hopefulness. So I'm just, I'm just suggesting doing something real that's right in front of them um, that they can, they can let their imagine. Now, I just wanna say one thing about the Chinese students because I, I felt like many, many of them were told before they came to Canada, watch what you say, you're being watched. And many of them would trespass that boundary to talk about real things. And it was fascinating. And we would talk about uh, how their grandparents would use human manure to uh, uh, grow crops. And could that happen nowadays? And they said, no, because we're too big. And then we go into this whole conversation. And it's just a fascinating thing to do a cross cultural education and listen carefully to what is being told to them and then them already had thought maybe that's not quite the way it is. So cross cultural education is, is fascinating to me. Thank you. I didn't mean to spend so much time, but you know how name is and how educators are. We just get all fired up. So that um <laughs> There is the photograph showing the transition from horses to cars in the book. And it was 10, right. 10 years, 10 years. It's all it took, yeah. complete transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, getting back to the watershed model, Nikki, one thing I remember that back in the day um, was that when we were kind of wrapping up with those positive ideas about ways people can be involved in change. We had those little pillars of hope that we would put down with each idea to, to kind of go with it. And it seemed to somehow stick and, and, get, and help get conversations to, to carry on too. But it, yeah, it's just so important to try to wrap up with ways that, not just wrap up, but to include the ways that everybody can be part of, part of the solution. I love I love the conversation and I love your presentation and you know, Nikki's points. I think it's very important, of course, as you say, that there's a positive element, and that is, I think, most and and the heart component. And um, I think, as you've both pointed out, these things are most accessible through environmental education or action or activism, not necessarily linked specifically to climate change. Because you can do a lot of stuff which is you know, environmentally sound. And I think the beauty of that is that, you know, we can all go buy electric cars and climate change is not going to, you know, change overnight. So there's a real danger that, you no, know, we've got to, you know, we're lobbying for these changes in technology which will cause a certain amount of short-term pain if adequately um, applied. I think Shelburne Street was empty 
you know, during the early parts of COVID. But, you know, people suffered to make it empty. And mm -hmm. uh, I think there's going to be a lot of suffering associated with the climate change question specifically. And you won't see the results. So if you can frame it in terms of positive things that apply not only to climate change, but also to climate adaptation, which is the reality, I think, really. And I mean, David Anderson, I'm not sure if I, I'm, I think I told Nikki this, but you know, he's part of our board. And he um, was part of creating um, the Rio 92 conference, which was sort of the start of all those climate talks. And he says, nothing has changed. You know, it's still the same talk. And his feeling is that it's hung up on the climate justice component. So there's just no way you'll go forward on that. And the other mm -hmm. thing is nobody wants to make the first move in terms of real investment in climate change. Yeah. And both of those, I mean, they're really tough questions. And I mean, his point is that you need to uncouple those two, but then somehow someone has to make that first move, which is political suicide. But it still needs to be done. But I think at the local level, those local questions, you know, with empathy and so on, it, at least it'll get us through the adaptation side yeah. of things. Yeah. Woody. I, so sort of piggybacking on what, what Yogi just said, I'm, I've been following a lot of what's going on in Ukraine with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Europe, of course, has freaked out. Uh, rightly so. And um, one of the things that they're realizing is their reliance on Russian oil and gas is not good. So there's some speculation that in the short term, this is horrible, but in the long term, it may actually be good for climate change because it will accelerate the move to renewables and away from, from fossil fuels. Just kind of curious what, Anne, what, what you think about that. Do you see a silver lining in that somewhere or well, it's, it's certainly mixed. I, I know there's a lot of talk about that. And, you know, on the other side, we have Jason Kenney trying to sell Canadian oil <laughs> to fill the gap. Um, so, so yes, I think it may, it may do that. But, on, you know, the sad thing is that, and then there's a, a bit about this in the book, is that the military contribution to emissions is absolutely enormous. And it is not like, it's not included in the climate calculations. Like they don't have to, the US government doesn't tell anybody, you know, that they actually burn a million barrels of oil a day. So, you know, that's kind of this, this elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. So, so how much this, that this conflict actually has set us back, we don't, we don't know, it's probably enormous. You know, the just that's what the you know that's what NATO is doing, just sending more and more arms and bombs, and and the kind of those, those other conversations aren't happening. So, you know, like this whole climate conversation, there's no kind of clear cut answer. Yeah, Peggy. Oh, you're on mute. Works when I'm on mute. Um. <laughs> Uh, just commenting on that, I think that that comes under the category of growth too, because I, what I'm surprised at is all these nations who are supposed to not be building up arms have all these weapons that they can send over to the Ukraine. And I really think that it really hurts us in that area where we need to recognize that we don't want to grow arms forever. That is really a bad way of, of behaving. But the one thing that I think on the positive side that really strikes me about your questions is that um, you can do your self-care by being in nature and you can do your subversive action in nature too. And so you can actually meet a lot of the, the needs that, that will help the environment by having a good time outdoors, which is what this group is really good at. Mm -hmm. I know from being around some of these people that there's there's no shortage of enthusiasm for that, but I, I think it's other people that we can start to draw out with us that would be really, really important because there's something that happens in nature and we all know it when we spend time there. 
but people don't know it if they don't go out and just mm-hmm. experience the feeling of you know being on an island where you're looking down and seeing the storm coming at you in a day on a day like today like just really feeling little and uh, kind of insignificant and recognizing what's going on yeah really it would be fun to to share some of that with kids who are inner city kids mm-hmm. yeah like like the sequeria do kathy and yeah. you, i know you've been doing that for a long time bringing nature into the classroom but that whole thing is really really important i think to get those kids who don't get a chance to experience nature out and recognizing that wow this feels good and i can do this little thing where um, I can join these people and they're going to be planting trees or they're going to be doing something that is helping the climate in some way. I know there's a lot that needs to be done and those little actions won't do it all, but it feels like it's those kids going home and talking to their parents about those difficult conversations that are so hard to have. I mean, even amongst us, I had that conversation about flying with you the other night because I'm I am going back east to visit my family and to go to a therapeutic touch conference, which is something that I do for self care. But I'm going to burn fossil fuels and I'm really pushing hard on the conference organizers to put in some information about offsets so that people understand. Yes, in order to get here, you did something that changed the, the situation for the worse. Now it's time to turn that around and do something that's going to change the situation in the world for the better. So it's, yeah. Good example of of talking about it. um, I don't know if you know um, uh, Catherine Hayhoe. She's a Canadian uh, scientist, but she works in the U.S., uh, Texas. And she's very kind of well-known in the kind of social media world. And she talks, she's part of the, IPCC uh, group and she does uh, the American um, uh, publications as well. And she says the one of the most important things we can do is just to talk about it amongst ourselves with other people, whether they agree with us or not. She has a great book that I just read, just came out, it's called Saving Us. And it's all about having those climate conversations. And she, there's some pretty wild stories where she's just like talking to <laughs> the the worst deniers um and you know she said don't even bother with them there's about seven percent of the population that are still in that kind of denial for whatever reason their own kind of benefit but um she said most other people you know can can hear what you're saying if you do it in the right way so it's a great book a friend of mine who's not an environmentalist per se, um, has started going up to cars that are running when someone's waiting for someone and they leave their car idling. And he'll go up and he'll say, do you know your car is running? Like he'll go up and just in a really uh, calm way. And he's only had one person get really mad at him, but he's just pointing out that you don't need to leave your car running to wait for your kids to come out of school or whatever you're doing. Unless you have a car that won't start again, that would be a good case to leave it running. But most people don't have those kind of cars but it's just um it's crazy but wonderful that there are those kinds of little actions that people yeah yeah and you know a lot of people say individual actions you know that that it's not going to do it you know even the community you know at a community level but at the very least it makes us feel better you know i think even if you yeah yeah. sorry finish in yeah it, it it just you know, gives you a positive, a positive outlook on life, just to be doing something, um, whatever that may be, and doing it with others that are like-minded. Yeah, Kathy? It, well, I was just thinking it back in relation to what Peggy was saying, where just the conversations, just on mm-hmm. one level, even if you've just got one person thinking about that in a different way, then, then that keeps, that keeps snowballing too. And I think mm-hmm. it is really really key and you know for me the during COVID the one big silver lining that I keep hoping is going to grow was how everybody really did come together towards Mm -hmm. a single cause like across the globe Mm -hmm. and the changes we saw in the environment from not planes not being flying over and all, all those kinds of really immediate changes in terms of air quality and all that but I 
I'm still waiting for like, why can't we do it when it comes to the environment? What what is yeah. it? What is it? Yeah, yeah I I haven't the this new IPCC report that just came out today. It was on the news. It was kind of grim, basically saying that we're nowhere, the commitments are nowhere near getting us to below 1.5 and we're probably going to be up above three. And it was but they they include in this report a lot of that behavioral stuff. Yeah. And um I haven't I haven't read it yet, but it, it'll be interesting to see what what they say. Um, how do we do those behavioral nudges to get you know governments to to move? Yeah. And I think I think that that COVID comparison has been made a lot. And I, I think it is you know how can governments say well we can do this but we can't do that? So yeah. it it may have something to do with some of the some of the announcements made yeah. in Canada at least recently. Yeah. Yeah. And just the cooperation internationally to make sure yeah. we could get it all working. Just yeah, yeah. And we did it before with um, you know you know ozone depleting chemicals that was done quite quickly right. around yeah. the world. Um, yeah, lots of foot dragging. And it's you know what is it something like twenty percent of the world's population produces eighty percent of the emissions. You know, and it's. It's that, and the, and the one percent of those twenty are kind of the, the real frequent flyers, the business people, and and all that. So, it's a it's very complex. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. This is great. Uh, here, I'm going to stop recording. Oh, now we can come up with the real... <laughs>